Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. It's very we, nice to be back on this stage after, yeah. I think, seven years. We was there anybody to... here last time I was here? A couple. Wow. Uh, I must have blown the others it. Have died, the others have died of food poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to get a more enthusiastic audience for you, so sorry. We could oh, it's not bad. I wanted to just jump straight into sort of, you know, a lot of the audience know the basics here. Well, first question I've got is, how come your book's thinner than my book? Uh, that's a good question. Did you write more? The post-its? I don't, I don't know. know. It's been lugging this around. We're going to talk a lot about set and setting. So we just we should just explain that as a preamble because I want to go from there to something else. What are we talking yeah. about? We talk about set and setting. When we talk about psychedelics. So set and setting were terms actually uh, introduced by Timothy Leary, the famous psychedelic uh, researcher turned evangelist. Um, and uh, he was trying to get at the idea that the kinds of experiences people have on psychedelics are highly dependent on uh, their expectations and their environment. So set is your mindset, and setting is the actual environment you're taking it in. And this can profoundly affect the experience. Now this is true to some extent with all drugs, but to a, to a really exaggerated extent with psychedelics. And it argues for, um, uh, you know, really uh, working on, on those things. And the, and the therapists who are using this do. I mean, you know, kind of shaping the expectation, the intention, uh, and making sure that you're not doing these drugs in a, in a white room with a buzzing fluorescent light. So we'll come back to a, a lot of that. Uh, well, later. that's how they started. In the yeah. 50s, they would just put you in a hospital room and dose you, and, and that's people, people didn't forget. have a good there time. Two, there were two waves of psychedelic research. It was that first way where thousands upon thousands of people were experimented upon in, in addiction, alcoholism, and so on. So, I mean, there was a large body of research which got forgotten. Yeah, I, so this was one of my big surprises when I started on this. And in fact, it was a surprise on, on, on the part of many of the, research, the younger researchers. But I think most of us assume that psychedelics are a product of the 60s and that the word psychedelic is a 60s word um, and it conjures images of the 60s. But in fact, there had been this long, very fertile and um, productive period of research uh, from the time that Albert Hoffman in, basically discovers LSD, um, from about the late 40s, early 50s, through um, the, the mid-60s. And um, there were, as you say, 40,000 research subjects were dosed with LSD or psilocybin or mescaline. Um, there were 1,000 peer-reviewed papers. And there were actually six international conferences dedicated to LSD alone between 1950 and 1965. So this was a serious branch of psychiatry. And, and, and in major research centers? Oh, yeah, at major research centers. And uh, in Canada, in England, in Switzerland, in the United States. Um, and they were getting some good results. Um, they were... Alcoholism was a particularly promising indication. They were, the meta-analysis that have been done since suggests that they were getting about 50% success rates treating alcoholics, which is better excellent. Yeah, it's better than what's out there. They were giving it to people who had cancer, uh, not to cure their cancer, but help them deal with their uh, anxiety and depression. Um, and they were doing it for depression. They were trying everything, basically. And the guy who invented, who created Alcoholics Anonymous thought LSD yeah, should be used. Yeah, Bill W., Bill Wilson. Um, well, it's interesting. He got sober on a psychedelic experience, but it wasn't a psychedelic. It was a, a delirium uh, called Belladonna. And um, in the 50s, after this had happened, and he'd started AA, he got... Uh, LSD therapy in uh, Los Angeles and thought that LSD would be a fantastic thing to add to the program. Um, this would be the 13th step. The 13th step or the, or the step zero. <laughs> yeah. And the idea was that sort of like the DTs, this, this horrible experience of hitting bottom that leads to a spiritual awakening in some people, that you could kind of simulate it with psychedelics and give people the kind of... Uh, ego transcendence that is at the heart of, of AA. I mean, you know, the whole idea of a higher power and, and um, 
Uh, so there was a certain logic to it, but from a marketing and branding point of view, it just didn't go over um, with the board. No. They turned him down. Funny that. So I, I want to come back to set and setting, because possibly in modern history, the only uncontaminated experience yeah. of a psychedelic was indeed Hoffman. Yeah. Because he had no expectation this was an accident. So this is before Leary and Aldous Huxley and so on. Yeah. So describe his trip. What happened? Well, so, first of all, you just preamble. He found, he found the drug by accident in 1938. Yes. He was looking for something else. He was, uh, he was a chemist at Sandoz, big pharmaceutical company, now part of Novartis. Um, and he was looking for a drug to help women in childbirth. And there was a lot of folk medicine that had involved ergot, which is a fungus on grain that's been implicated in various episodes of weirdness in European Sinatis history. Sinatis fire and so on. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and the Salem witch trials, some people believe. Um, in wet years, you would eat the bread that had this infection and you would have hallucinations, but you also had gangrene and some other things. And <laughs> so it was, it was not something Sandals people Sandoz probably wasn't that worried about no. that, so a minor detail. <laughs> So, but they were using some ergot derivative to help women uh, staunch bleeding during childbirth. And so he was looking for a drug that would do that. And he was doing these derivatives of ergotamine, the, the chemical. And the 25th one was uh, LSD-25. And um, they tested it on animals and nothing much happened. And they put it on the shelf. But then in 1943, and this is a sort of mysterious, uh, he had this kind of um, intuition that he had to take a second look at that particular molecule. He thought it was an unusually beautiful molecule and uh, something told him he needed to resynthesize it and he did and he got a little, he ingested a little somehow on his finger and his eye, I didn't know what happened and he, and he had a, 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 you know, feelings of something going on in his mind. Because it doesn't take much. You just... it, it's, it takes so little. I mean, this is one of the strongest psychoactive molecules we know of. It's measured in micrograms, right? Millions of a gram, not milligrams. Um, and so he realized there was, he had a psychoactive substance here. And so the next thing he did was, well, let me take a real dose. And not knowing how powerful it was, he took 250 micrograms, which... Oh, some, some of you understand, there are some yes. In the audience. <laughs> <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> yeah, the facial recognition has gotten That's all right, the laughers. Yeah. Um, and um, so, he, so he takes this bigger dose. He's in the lab with his young lab assistant, and he realizes, oh shit, this is, this is serious. And the walls are vibrating, and the furniture is coming to life, and he says to his assistant, I've got to get home. And, uh, and they take a bicycle, it's the wartime, gasoline is being rationed. And I, I picture this very wobbly bicycle ride. It's actually still celebrated. Uh, bicycle day. On bicycle day, April 19th, uh, I think it is. And um, he gets home and he, and he summons the doctor. Um, Did he think he was dying? He, he didn't know, he was worried he might be. He didn't know what was going on, but he thought there was something very wrong. And it wasn't pleasant at this point at all. Um, and I think he's kind of fighting what's happening. And the doctor comes and says, you're fine. Your pupils are dilated, but all your vitals are fine. And this allowed Take him to relax. Take two aspirin and see me in the morning. <laughs> exactly. Not even. And uh, as, the, as time goes on, he gets comfortable with the feeling. He goes out in his garden and he, and he describes this, uh, you know, be beautific scene uh, you know, everything is, is jeweled with dew, and it's like, he's, he felt like Adam on the first day of creation. And, and he had this long afterglow that lasted for a couple days. So that's the first acid trip. And you're right, it's the only one that was innocent of any expectation. Every other one has been informed by stories people have heard. Aldous Huxley's in particular, I think that's informed everybody. Um, but um, The doors of perception. Yeah, but the problem was, he had this powerful drug, but they really didn't know what it was good for. And that's what launched is this 15-year period of research, essentially trying to figure that out. And Sandoz did something very interesting, which was they... They made it available freely. They did. They crowdsourced this R&D effort. And they said to any researcher, if you will merely report back what you learn about LSD-25, we will give you as much as you want. <laughs> and, and really, all you needed was a good letterhead. And... <laughs> 
Well, there was this guy, this weird guy who was a spy and a an oh, adventurer. Al Hubbard, and yeah. He, he accumulated a whole bu bunch of this stuff. So Al Hubbard is, is, I think, the most interesting character that I turned up in, in my research of the history. Um, and Al Hubbard is truly a man of mystery. And, and I certainly wasn't able to answer all the questions about him. But what we do know about him is um, he, was a, uh, he was born in Kentucky in 1902. He didn't apparently have a pair of shoes till he was 12. He was kind of a real hillbilly, uh, but he was brilliant and he was a great tinkerer and uh, he invented a, uh, radio act, a, a radium battery that used radioactive material to generate power, which doesn't sound like a very good idea, but he sold it and for like $75,000 when he was still quite young. He had all these careers. He was, a, he was a, a rum runner during Prohibition, but he was also a spy for uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. He, he smuggled arms to England when it was still illegal to do this before 1939, yet he was also working for the OSS. Um, so he was a very complicated person, and he was also a Catholic mystic. And... So his story, he's actually as important as Timothy Leary, I think, to the history of LSD. I mean, there's a long chapter in one of your books on Johnny Appleseed and the spread yes. of apples, and you call him the Johnny Appleseed of... Uh... The Johnny Appleseed of LSD. Yeah. So, so Hubbard has, after he's made all this money, he owns boats, he lives in British Columbia, he's got an island to himself, he's loaded, he's in his 50s, and he doesn't know what to do next. He has an ange what he calls an angelic visitation. He's hiking in, in Washington State, and an angel comes to him and says, you're going to learn about something that could change the direction of human history, and you can choose to be involved or not. And he has no idea what she's talking about. A year later, he reads an academic paper about LSD, and he, get, and he decides this could be it. He gets a hold of some LSD and it tries it. Some. What? It was a lot. Oh, no, no, no. That, 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 this later. is before he went and got it. Right. Yeah. And he has a, a powerful mystical experience, and he realized this is what's going to change the course of human history. He then goes to Sandoz and asks them for a supply uh, as a researcher. Um, he's involved with the OSS in Switzerland, so I think he's kind of wired there. And they give him what is variously described as a liter bottle of LSD. Um, <laughs> or uh, I forget how many doses, but it was enough to turn on a significant of percentage of the human population. <laughs> <laughs> and he keeps, he buries some of it in Death Valley, but he always Do we has, know where? <laughs> <laughs> this would be more valuable than gold. It, it would be, it would be. And he, um, and he but he, he carries it around in a satchel, and he decides he is going to, change human history by turning on the best and brightest. He's an elitist. He's, he's really kind of a Mandarin for a hillbilly. And he, um, uh, so he, he proceeds to go around the world administering LSD to people. And he actually understood set and setting before the terms were coined because he realizes that the researchers were doing it all wrong by giving it in that, you know, that antiseptic room. So he said, no, you gotta play music. You have to have some nice imagery. You should have some fresh flowers. And he actually became quite a gifted therapist. And he went, so for example, he turned on uh, bishops in the Catholic Church. He turned on people in the US government. We don't know exactly who. He J. Edgar? No, he tried though. He actually reached out to J. Edgar Hoover who would not play. Um, and which is not surprising, yeah, I guess. Yeah, the set would have been a bit wrong. <laughs> Um, he did turn on uh, some people in Silicon Valley, though, and began what became a long tradition of psychedelic use. You know, many of us think Steve Jobs, was, who talked about his LSD use, as, as really determinative of his aesthetic. And he famously said that um, Windows would be a much better product if Bill Gates had tripped. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Bill Gates responded, but I did! <laughs> <laughs> So, so Hubbard <laughs> plays this very key role, spreading it uh, around. And, um, and was he working for the CIA at the same time? Maybe. 
Because there are all these stories about CIA doing LSD experiments. Well, this is, we know the CIA, it came out in the 70s that the CIA had a research program that was parallel to this other research program, but they were trying to weaponize LSD. They were using it, first they thought it was a truth serum, but people said crazy shit. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't truthful. And then they... Oh, really? <laughs> well, maybe some truth. Um, and then That's they why J. Edgar Hoover didn't want to do it. <laughs> Then they, um, then they thought they would put it in the water supply and disable a population. And there's some rumors that they tried that in some small town in France. I don't know if it's true. Um, anyway, so they, had, they, they did horrible things with it. Okay. They dosed people without their knowledge. Um, it, was, it was really an ugly chapter. And, we, and we, we don't know the half of it. So let's just talk. I want to come to your experiences in a minute. But let's just talk about some of the stuff that you talk about in the book, which... It's towards the end of the book, but it, it strikes me as really important to frame the beginning as well, which is about ego, it's about self, it's about dissolution, and it's about this weird neurological network called the default, default mode network, um, which controls and traffics our brain. So let, because I think that we'll understand some stuff a bit better when we understand that. So first of all, the experience of ego and self and dissolution. That seems to be a common theme regardless of which yeah. drug you take. Yeah. So how psychedelics work is, is not that well understood. Although in this new wave, this renaissance of research, we have tools we didn't have then. One of them is neuroimaging, fMRI and MEG and some other modes. And one of the most interesting findings, I'm going to start with the default mode network and work toward the ego issue, is that um, when they began imaging the, uh, the, the brains of people on psilocybin and LSD, which involves essentially injecting them and then sliding them into an MRI. I mean, if you've ever been in an MRI machine, talk about set and setting. That is, <laughs> it's not optimal. Very narrow setting. We, we, we owe these volunteers an enormous debt of gratitude. <laughs> um, they, they kind of expected to see a very excited brain with lots of centers um, lighting up. But they were very surprised to see that one particular network that I had never heard of was down-regulated, was, was silenced, basically. And that's the default mode network. What is the default mode network? It, is, um, it was only discovered about 15, 20 years ago. And it's a very tightly linked set of structures that uh, involve the uh, prefrontal cortex, the posterior singular cortex, and these deeper, older centers tied to uh, emotion and memory. It's a regulatory network. Uh, it kind of, the brain is a hierarchical system, and it's kind of at the top. It's, uh, one researcher called it the orchestra conductor. The traffic manager. Yeah, the traffic manager. And, and lots of information passes through this hub. What does the default mode network do? Well, it appears to be involved in self-reflection, mind-wandering. Uh, the reason it was discovered is that when you put someone in an fMRI and you're going to give them a task to do, you need a baseline. So they, they would say, don't, don't do anything, don't think about anything, and it would light up. It's kind of where the mind goes when it's not occupied by attention. Um, and so it's involved in self-reflection, time travel, the ability to think about the, the future and the past, um, theory of mind, the ability to impute mental states to other beings, which is important to moral, you know, moral development, and things like that. And something called the narrative or autobiographical self. And that's, that's the way we take the events of our lives and weave them into the story of who we think we are. So to the extent that the ego has a location in the brain, it, it's, it's in this network, it appears. And interestingly enough, this network goes quiet. Um, and the, the degree to which it's silenced correlates with reports from uh, volunteers of ego dissolution, this sense that yourself is gone and you are just this disembodied awareness or you, you've merged with something larger than yourself. But the walls of ego have come down. Which people, when they're guiding you through this, often talk about if you come across something fearful, walk towards it because it's, this causes the fear in some ways, is that you feel yourself falling The preservation falling apart. of ego. Um, and, I, and I think that, and that's one of the reasons I think it's so central. So when they're preparing you in this guided uh, psychedelic therapy, which is different than the way it's used recreationally, they do tell you, um, if you feel like you're melting, going crazy, dying, 
go with it. Don't fight it. If, yes, if you see a monster, um, you know, step right up to it and say, what are you doing in my mind? Um, I think you asked at one point of one guy, uh, what happens to the people who die? And he said, we bury them with the other dead. Well, that was... <laughs> Which gave you great comfort. That was when I was interviewing a guide for myself. Anyway, I, and, um, I interrupt, I'm oh, sorry. That's okay, I would, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, so anyway, go towards anyway, the I'll fear. I'll get to that, so yeah. let me stick to, let me stay on this thread. Um, so when your ego dissolves, um, interesting things happen. One is you, you, there's no subject object duality. You, you become part of something bigger and that can be an incredibly ecstatic experience. But if you're fighting to hold on to your ego, and the ego tries to preserve itself, you're going to be really anxious. And I think that is at the root of many so-called bad trips, this desire to hold on when you're melting. And also, if, if it's happening and, and you're at a festival or, you know, I don't know, at, at the dinner table, <laughs> um, <laughs> you're going to fight. And, and so what a good guide will do is create an environment, a set and setting, where you feel safe enough to let go. And I did have an experience where that happened that was, that was quite profound. And, um, and, you know, it sounds like a scary thing, um, but if you surrender, uh, it's, it's actually an ecstatic thing in the literal sense of you're outside your normal self. So bits of the brain are communicating with each other which don't normally do so. so when this regulatory hub goes down, what's interesting, and there's an illustration uh, in the book, um, it, it, instead of all these signals passing through it and being, you know, trafficked around, um, they start talking to each other. So for the first time, say, your visual cortex is talking directly to your memory or emotion centers. And that might explain synesthesia, the ability that, you know, that you can see music or, or smell it. Um, and so you get all this new traffic. The brain is rewired temporarily, and new connections are being made, uh, and some of them may have lasting effects. Um, you know, we don't know yet exactly, but, um, and the brain becomes much more densely connected. The, um, so the, the, is it in, it's on, yeah, it's here. So I hope you can see this. This is, <laughs> We need a projector. This is like the worst PowerPoint you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> you can't read the small writing, but just take, trust me that it's there. Anyway, but just compare that. <laughs> this is the brain networks around the outside. Each circle is a brain network, and this is the main traffic. And you see there's a couple superhighways. And then this is the brain on psychedelics. Trust him. <laughs> All right, get your eyes tested. You're going to have to buy the boot. <laughs> And some people have more active, just in their normal mode, they have more active default uh, mode uh, networks than others, and it has consequences for their personality and whether they're liable to get depression or not. Yeah, so one theory of depression is that it's, it, it involves an overactive default mode network. Um, the default mode network is trying to you know, run the show, and um, sometimes it becomes um, hypervigilant, say. And um, so, one of the theories, so the kinds of disorders that psychedelics appears in this, in this research to help, things like depression, anxiety, addiction, obsession, they're all at one end of the spectrum of mental um, function, which is to say they're characterized by very rigid thinking, by um, habits that have become really deeply ingrained that you can't break out of. And this may be something enforced by the default mode network. Um, and, and that storytelling function I mentioned. So people get trapped in these narratives about themselves that, you know, I can't get through the day without a drink or a cigarette. I'm unworthy of love. Um, my work is hoping, shit. Yeah. And, um, and it is the ego that's telling those stories. And sometimes we get stuck in them. And, and what happens at the other end? Because that's where maybe there's some risk in psychedelics. Yeah. So at the psychosis. other end, you have schizophrenia and, um, uh, you know, a disordered mind. And um, for people in that situation, it does not appear that psychedelics are a good idea. Um, and indeed, there are some people who have had psychotic breaks on psychedelics. So the risk issue is worth addressing, though, I think. Um, you know, before I had the experiences I did for this book, I, I felt I couldn't write a book on psychedelics without having some, uh, a series of psychedelic experiences, because I hadn't done it at the age-appropriate stage of life. 
and um, I'm kind of a late bloomer uh, when it comes to psychedelics. I was nervous about it. I was very reluctant. And, you know, 20-year-old males are fairly reckless. And, you know, 58-year-old males, not so much. And but before, before we leave the default mode network, yeah. babies have a low level. And I think in your book you talk about baby, you know, the baby brain is probably tripping. Yeah, so the default mode network doesn't really kick in until six, seven, eight, when you're really getting that sense of a self and an ego is developing. And, um, uh, and that might explain um, infant consciousness or baby consciousness. And, and one, of my, um, one of the people I spent a lot of time interviewing in this book is a, uh, a brilliant child uh, psychologist named Alison Gopnik, uh, who teaches at Berkeley, as, as do I. She's, she's in the psychology department. And she's convinced that the, the tripping mind bears a very close relationship to the mind of young children, under five or six. So what, what do we know lowers the activity? Because it's not just psychedelics no, lower oh no. the activity of this. And it's critical to this issue of, do you need to take a psychedelic? Are there, are there are other ways to do it. Uh, there, and, and we'll learn about more. The one we know about for sure, and this was really interesting, um, at the same time uh, they were imaging the brains of people on LSD and psilocybin at, in London at Imperial College, a psychiatrist at Yale was imaging the brains using the same uh, technology of very experienced meditators, people with more than 10,000 hours of meditation experience. He would put them in and ask them to meditate. And guess what? Their brains looked identical. The, the default mode network is silenced also in, me, in successful meditation. Um, and that sort of makes sense because there is a loss of ego. Um, so we know that's another way to silence the default mode. And you network. silenced it by recapitulating your psychedelic experience. And I did, I did a very interesting kind of neural feedback exercise with this psychiatrist. Uh, his name is Judd Brewer, who's been studying a meditation as a, a technique for behavior change, addiction and things like that. And he had set up uh, a neural feedback thing focused on one particular part of the default mode network, the posterior cingulate cortex. This is the part that is involved in that storytelling function that constructs the narrative of who we are. So if I show you a list of um, adjectives, um, you know, handsome, wealthy, generous, uh, cheap, um, and I just ask you to think about it, this, this part of your brain will not light up. But if I say, think about how all these adjectives apply or don't apply to you, it lights up. So it's really about making that connection between self and qualities in the world. Um, so I, I did this exercise with him and, um, uh, and to see if I could reduce activity in this part of the default mode network. And what I did, uh, and I didn't tell him I was gonna do this. He had various meditation exercises. Um, I said, I'm going to try something. Will you just measure this? And, uh, and, I, and I remembered a powerful psychedelic experience I'd had, an image that had come to me when I was on ayahuasca. And while I was experiencing it in my head, the default mode network went quiet. Um, and he was like, what happened? What were you thinking about? Um, so yeah, so there are probably other, many other ways we can do this. And you also, in a training session, did holotropic breathing. Describe what holotropic breathing is. Well, that's another, this probably also changes the default mode network, and I'll bet hypnotism does too, uh, but, but we haven't tried it. Holotropic breath work is a method of achieving a psychedelic state without a psychedelic drug. It was invented by Stanislav Grof, who was a Czech emigre psychiatrist, very involved with psychedelic, this period of psychedelic research I'm describing, but especially in the 60s. And when it was made illegal, he, he was having such success in his psych psychiatric practice that he wanted to come up with something else that would induce the state that was legal. So drawing on yogic traditions and, um, uh, you know, drumming and all these kind of traditional methods of inducing trance, he came up with something called holotropic breathwork, where essentially you enter into a pattern of breathing that's very fast, and you're hearing strong rhythmic music, you're exhaling more than you're inhaling, you're hyperventilating basically. And I did this, and you, and you it works for about three quarters of people. Um, I slipped into this trance state within like five minutes, um, where I, I no longer had to try to breathe that way. It sustained itself. I was on my back and I was moving, I was dancing on my back and 
I had this image of myself riding a horse through a forest. And it was the most uncanny thing. And it was just from breathing. And it, it, and it and lasted gave, about 45 minutes. And it gave you atrial fibrillation. It did. It had, it had a side effect. Yes, you're right. I had, no, I did. It had, the irony was, <laughs> sorry, you're, I'm, I have to double back. Yes, I have, I have, I had, I've actually had it fixed, uh, a, a heart condition called atrial fibrillation, which, um, where you, your heart goes into weird rhythms sometimes. And before I undertook any kind of psychedelic experience, this is the difference of doing psychedelics in your late 50s. I consulted my cardiologist. <laughs> and and he, your proctologist? <laughs> no, I didn't go that far. Um, and he, he kind of green-lighted everything except MDMA, ecstasy. And, um, and this guide I was working with usually starts with ecstasy and then moves you to LSD. And I said, look, I can't do the ecstasy. Um, he doesn't recommend it because it's an amphetamine and it drives up your heart rate. But ironically, on the no drug experience, I had an episode, a very scary episode of atrial fibrillation. So let's talk about your experiences. I mean, no, let's just finish okay. talking about risk. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot to cover. Um, so in addition to going my, to my cardiologist and learning about this, um, I, before I did this, I wanted to know what kind of danger I was putting myself in. And, and what I learned about psychedelics was pretty surprising. I learned first that they're remarkably, and, and here I'm talking specifically about psilocybin and LSD, they're remarkably non-toxic drugs. There is no lethal dose that has ever been found for LSD or psilocybin. And you know, you can't say that. They're over-the-counter drugs that have a, a well-known lethal dose. Tylenol is, a, is an example. It's a couple dozen pills. Um, so that's pretty remarkable and reassuring. And I also found that, uh, learned that they're non-addictive. They're not habit-forming. Um, they don't have that reinforcement effect. And so if you have a rat in a cage uh, and you've set it up, you know, that classic drug test where they have two levers, one uh, administers the drug to their bloodstream, the other gives them, um, you know, sugar water, sucrose. Um, and if it's cocaine, the, the, the rat will keep pressing that lever until it dies, or heroin until it's addicted. You give it LSD, once. That's it. <laughs> they will never go back to that lever. <laughs> they don't know how to interpret the experience. Um, so, anyway, so it doesn't, it doesn't affect the dopamine centers the way, you know, classic drugs of addiction do. But there are risks, and the risks are psychological. Um, and that there are, people can have terrifying experiences. There was a study done of people who'd had bad trips just last year, a survey, and in 7.8%, between 7 and 8% of the people had sought psychiatric help within the first year afterwards. So it had lingering effects that were very troubling. And there are a Guided certain, or unguided? These were unguided. Unguided. And I think that that's important. Um, and there are a certain number of people who have had psychotic breaks on LSD this, and, and psilocybin. This really does happen. Whether they would have eventually had them anyway is a question. Uh, some people think that, um, you know, it's any kind of mental trauma or mental disturbance can kick it off. It can be alcohol, cannabis, a divorce of your parents at that window when people get schizophrenia. So, so they're, they're real psychological risks, but they are mitigated to some extent, to a large extent, by having a guide, someone who can talk you through difficult times and actually help you benefit from that bad trip. I mean, it's like a nightmare. You can analyze it and get some value uh, if you're with a good uh, therapist. And there was only one where you had a really bad experience. Yeah, I had, um, most of my experiences were really good, better than I expected them to be. I, I just didn't know what was going to come up. I mean, I was really afraid of discovering, you know, I don't know, childhood trauma or something. But, and was it a gap in the book that made you do this or a gap in your life? Made me do it at all? Yeah. It was both. I mean, I, I needed to do this to understand and write about it. It's kind of, the, it's the journalism I do. I like to do participatory journalism. I, you know, when I wrote about the cattle industry, I bought a cow. When I wrote about architecture, I built a house. So my readers expect it, right? Um, so I did it for them. Um, but I also did it 
because I had started interviewing these volunteers. And the first group I interviewed were these people who had cancer, many of them terminal, who were being given the drug, not to treat their cancer, obviously, it doesn't do anything for your cancer, but to help them deal with their anxiety, depression, fear. And their stories were so amazing, the kinds of spiritual breakthroughs they were having, the, uh, the kind of reset of their, um, of their minds um, made me incredibly interested to try it. Um, I had never had a spiritual experience. I don't think I had ever had one. And I was kind of jealous uh, of these people. And um, so... And with the people with terminal cancer, it apparently only worked if you did get some ego dissolution and a mystical experience. Yeah, yeah. You there, was a, that. there was a real one-to-one -one correspondence. So they were measuring something called mystical experience, which is a, there's, you know, the psychologists have a chart, have a survey for everything and, and a score for everything. So they've actually like quantified the mystical experience. And it has these, you know, there are like eight characteristics. One is ego transcendence. Another is unitive consciousness that you're joining with something else. Another is transcendence of space and time. You know, they have this list. And the people who had had a, a, what's called a complete mystical experience were the ones that had substantial reductions in their fear uh, and depression around death. Uh, I'll, I'll just give one example of a, of a woman who, who had a remarkable story. Um, she, she had had ovarian cancer. She was about 60. She was a figure skating instructor in, in Manhattan named Dina Baser. And um, her cancer had been treated, it was in remission, but she was paralyzed by the fear it was gonna recur at any time, that the other shoe was gonna drop. And she couldn't do very much. And she entered this trial and was, you know, had the careful preparation session with the two guides, and then the guides are with her during the, the whole journey, which lasts about, I don't know, five or six hours. And like a lot of the cancer patients, her experience took her inside her body. She had this kind of experience of traveling inside her body. And um, many of the cancer patients had a confrontation with their cancer. Uh, in her case, though, um, she sees a black mass under her rib cage. So she knows it's not her cancer. It's in the wrong place. Um, but she recognizes it immediately. And she knows it's her fear. And she spontaneously screams at it. Now imagine these two guides, they don't know what's going on in her head, and suddenly she says, get the fuck out of my body! <laughs> and with that, it vanished. The fear vanished. And I wrote this in a piece I wrote for The New Yorker about this particular trial, and, and in the measly way of journalists trying to thread the gauntlet of fact checkers, I said her fear was substantially diminished. Um, and they called her and they read it to her and she said, no, he got it wrong. That's totally wrong. My fear was extinguished, completely eliminated, which is the most remarkable thing. She, she also... Um, is this had, the woman who was an atheist? Yes. She also had told me before that she was an atheist. And then in, and I said, what happened after you got rid of your fear during the trip? She said, oh, it was the most amazing thing and this happened, this happened, and I kissed the face of God. And I said... But you tell me you're an atheist, so you're no longer an atheist? She says, no, I'm still an atheist. And, and I said, well, how can you kiss the face of God? And she said, we don't have a word big enough for what happened. God is the biggest word we have for a, this kind of experience. So I have to use it, but I'm still an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> so briefly, I mean, we haven't got time to go through everything, but you, where did you rate on the mystical scale and did it change according to set, setting and drug? You know, for me, I, I did fill out the mystical experience questionnaire because, you know, I, I wanted to see if I scored. Um, how, well, how, well did, how well did I do? <laughs> and on two of my trips, I did. I had complete mystical experiences. Interestingly enough, one was incredibly positive and one was incredibly negative. But I, in both cases, I had, you know, transcendence of space and time and, you know, unit of consciousness, all this kind of stuff. Um, and the bad one... Um, was um, really horrifying. Uh, that was DMT. So this the was, yeah. So this was a pretty obscure psychedelic that wasn't on my agenda, and it's not being researched in a serious way. And it's called 5-MeO DMT. Nobody's clapping for it. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> this is the some toad riders in the audience. This is the. Um, 
smoked venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad. Right? I mean, a species that figures that out, right, has yeah. got something going for it. There's a lot of them in Balmain. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I had this opportunity. One of my sources said that this person who was coming up from Mexico who collects the venom, and by the way, no, no toads are harmed in the making of the psychedelic. You just gently squeeze these glands, and it shoots this liquid onto a glass piece of glass. And We're then taking notes now, are we? <laughs> and then, well, you've got to find the toads. You're not going to find them in Australia. And, um, and then it crystallizes, and then you smoke that crystal. So I had the opportunity to do this, and I really was afraid of it. And I had, I had interviewed somebody who had used it. Uh, a, a, an acquaintance of mine and, and she, she, you know, we, we were having lunch together and she reaches across and she puts her her hand on my forearm like this and she said, it's the Everest of psychedelics. <laughs> and I was really scared about using it. I was really, I mean, all my experiences I had a sleepless night before as my ego essentially tried to convince me to not this. to assault it. Uh, with, a, with a chemical, and, uh, and this one I did too, um, but I did it. Um, and if you'd like, I can read a, a, a passage about it, yeah. um, about this trip, um, which illustrates how bad things can get, but also some of the challenges of writing about this. Um, so you take one long puff from this pipe, um, and, uh, well, I'll begin with this. I have no memory of ever having exhaled or of being lowered onto the mattress and covered with a blanket. All at once I felt a tremendous rush of energy fill my head accompanied by a punishing roar. I managed barely to squeeze out the words I had prepared, trust and surrender. These words became my mantra, but they seemed utterly pathetic, wishful scraps of paper in the face of this category five mental storm. Terror seized me, and then, like one of those flimsy wooden houses erected on Bikini Atoll to be blown up in the nuclear tests, I was no more, blasted to a confetti cloud by an explosive force I could no longer locate in my head because it had exploded that too, expanding to become all that there was. Whatever this was, it was not a hallucination. A hallucination implies a reality and a point of reference and an entity to have it. None of those things remained. Unfortunately, the terror didn't disappear with the extinction of my eye. Whatever allowed me to register this experience, the post-egoic awareness I'd first experienced on mushrooms, was now consumed in the flames of terror too. In fact, every touchstone that tells us I exist was annihilated, and yet I remained conscious. Is this what death feels like? Could this be it? That was the thought, though there was no longer a thinker to have it. Here words fail. In truth, there were no flames, no blast, no thermonuclear storm. I'm grasping at metaphor in the hope of forming some stable and shareable concept of what was unfolding in my mind. In the event, there was no coherent thought, just pure and terrible sensation. Only afterward did I wonder if this was what the mystics call the mysterium tremendum, the blinding, unendurable mystery, whether of God or some other ultimate or absolute, before which humans tremble in awe. Aldous Huxley described it as the fear, quote, of being overwhelmed, of disintegrating under a pressure of reality greater than a mind accustoming, accustomed to living most of the time in a cozy world of symbols could possibly bear. Oh, to be back in the cozy world of symbols. After the fact, I kept returning to one of two metaphors, and while they inevitably deform the experience, as any words or metaphors or symbols must, they at least allow me to grasp hold of a shadow of it and perhaps share it. The first is the image of being on the outside of a rocket after launch. I'm holding on with both hands, legs clenched around it, while the rapidly mounting G-forces clutch at my flesh, pulling my face down into a taut grimace as the great cylinder rises through successive layers of clouds, exponentially gaining speed and altitude, the fuselage shuddering on the brink of self-destruction as, as it strains to break free from Earth's grip while the friction it generates as it crashes through the thinning air issues in a deafening roar. It was a little like that. 
The other metaphor was the Big Bang, but the Big Bang ran in, uh, run in reverse from our familiar world all the way back to a point before there was anything, no time or space or matter, only the pure, unbounded energy that was all there was then before an imperfection, a ripple in its waveform, caused the universe of energy to fall into time, space, and matter. Rushing backwards through 14 billion years, I watched the dimensions of reality collapse one by one until there was nothing left, not even being, only the all-consuming roar. It was just horrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's sort of a happy ending. Sort of? <laughs> so well, you're here. The best thing about 5-MeO-DMT is it only lasts about eight minutes. Um, and but the longest eight minutes of your life. The, it was the longest eight minutes of my life. But suddenly, and very quickly, I start, the world starts reconstituting. I suddenly like, can feel I have a body, and there's a floor, there's matter, and I can tell time is passing. And, and so all the coordinates of reality came back. And I had this incredible rush of gratitude. And it was, but it was a new kind of gratitude. It wasn't the gratitude most of us have felt, the gratitude of being alive. It was the gratitude that there is anything. <laughs> <laughs> because there could just as easily be nothing. <laughs> we could be before the Big Bang. And um, so that kind of fundamental gratitude was a new experience for me. So I won't say it made it worth it, <laughs> but close. How did people around you respond, your wife, your son, the people who know you? How do they respond? Do they see anything new? Were you nicer to live with? Well, my, <laughs> my wife was, was um, Judith, was nervous about the whole thing um, for a couple reasons. I think the big one was we've been together a very long time. We met in college. And all the big experiences of our adult lives we've shared, you know, having a kid, moving here or there, work experiences. Um, and here I was going to have a big experience potentially, and she wasn't part of it. Um, and so she felt like it was going to put a certain distance between us. And she also confessed to being worried that I'd change in some way. Didn't occur to her I might change for the better. Um, and if I were to interview her today here? Uh, well, if you were, she would tell you a few things. Because I have asked her, you know, so do, do you think this changed me and in what ways? And she felt that it, it did. She felt it made me uh, more open and more patient um, than I was. Um, and somewhat less defensive, which has to do with the kind of getting a little perspective on your ego. I mean, I think the value of having temporary ego dissolution is that you realize you're not as identical to your ego as you previously thought. And that it is a character in the drama of your inner life, but it's not the only one, and you don't always have to listen to it. And it has these moves and tricks that you can see for what they are. Um, but you did take psilocybin with her before you started? Yes, we did. Yes, yeah. so she, she, did, she, she ended up taking part in one of my experiences and then subsequently a couple others. So she, was, she found it interesting and useful. Only her mother kept appearing in all these trips. <laughs> and the Jewish mother gets everywhere, I can <laughs> tell Jewish you. The Jewish mother. Well, it didn't happen to me, but it happened to her, and it wasn't always happy. No. But um, It's one of the reasons I'd stay off it, I think. <laughs> so, but the other thing she said that I thought was really interesting and telling was um, she thought that I, my, my father died a year ago in January, and um, she thought that I handled that very differently than I would have before these experiences. And what she meant was that I was... Um, very present for the last 10 days of his life. I kind of moved into the apartment. He was 88. He died of lung cancer. And um, I was just with him, like, you know, hours and hours and hours and wanted to be there and lying with him in the bed and talking to him and saying what needed to be said. And, you know, I, I'm a busy person who could have concocted excuses not to be there all the time. And, but I wanted to be. And that presence, that openness to his death, I think had to do with the fact that I'd been interviewing all these cancer patients and, and had gotten very comfortable talking about death with them. And uh, although he never talked about dying um, at all, he processed it to the extent he did very internally. Um, and so, you know, I think there have been changes. I, I don't, it's not a night and day thing, 
Um, but I do think there have been some changes. There's one thing I noticed in the book. You talk about having interviewed 15 guides uh, to end up with five, you say, in the book, but you only describe four experiences. What's the one you didn't put in the book? Oh, let's see. Well, I'm not sure your math is right. So I... I, I I'm a doctor. I can only add up <laughs> to four or five. <laughs> I had a guided LSD trip. I had a guided psilocybin trip. I had two ayahuasca oh, and two ayahuasca. five... That's yeah, there were two the ayahuasca rest trips. Rest yeah, so Any now, difference between the drugs, or are they all pretty much the same? Um, I think they're more alike than not. I mean, leaving aside 5-MeO-DMT, I think psilocybin and LSD, in my experience, uh, the main difference is LSD lasts longer. Um, Why are the researchers focusing on psilocybin rather than LSD? It's a good question. Um, two reasons, one political and one practical. Um, practical reason is that an LSD trip can last 10 hours, and the researchers want to get home for dinner, you know. Um, <laughs> no, it's like, it's very hard to fit into the, yeah, the work day. Right. Um, you'd have to pay a lot of overtime and make the research very expensive. Um, and the other is that it's so notorious. It's, and, you know, you don't have a bunch of... So this of, is the one that the moral panic was over. The moral panic was around LSD, not psilocybin. And frankly, politicians don't know what psilocybin is, most of them. And so you're not going to have some know-nothing politician screaming about the government's funding psilocybin research, although they're not. Um, and uh, so I think it's safer politically. Well, they're not yet. So you had the 50s, where you had people like Cary Grant taking this. You had a lot of research, 40,000 subjects. And then it starts to go south, and Timothy Leary is often blamed for this. Yeah. Fairly? Yes and no. I mean, he definitely... Um, so he begins as a very serious researcher. He, uh, he's hired by Harvard. He has a psychedelic experience on psilocybin the summer before he goes to start at Harvard. He says he learned more about the human mind in four hours by the pool in Cuernavaca than he had in, like, 15 years of being a psychologist. And so he starts this project. Um, but he very quickly gets bored with science. Um, and he starts turning on poets and musicians. And his idea of research was to have a lot of people over to his house and give them Turn all on, psilocybin. And drop out. Yeah, and the, and the papers were like, psilocybin in a naturalistic setting. You know? Um, so he, 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 it made, he transcended science instead, instead of his ego. And, um, uh, and so he began... Um, when he got fired, he got fired from Harvard for uh, his partner, uh, Richard Alpert, who became Ram Dass, was giving uh, the drugs to undergraduates. They were only allowed to give it to graduate students. So they had violated their um, relationship with Harvard. And um, after he's fired, he becomes an evangelist. And this is an occupational hazard. I mean, people get involved with LSD and they think it really can solve the world's problems. And, um, and I get that kind of thinking. Um, there is a certain logic to it, but there's really, we don't have a model for administering a drug to a whole culture except for fluoride. And it's not like fluoride. Um, so he, he, um, uh, he starts proselytizing and the researchers think he's screwing it up for everybody and they try to stop him. Um, because he's, it's very frightening to the... it's still legal at this point. It's still legal at this point. It's legal in, up till 66, and it's not really nationally illegal till 1970. Um, but um, it, it becomes, it's, it's taken up by the counterculture. Um, President Nixon thinks it's fueling the reluctance of American boys to go to Vietnam, which may have been true. Um, and it, it's, you know, it did help... It wasn't the only factor creating the culture, but it's the counterculture, but it certainly gave it a lot of its character. I mean, it was an unprecedented moment, if you think about it, where since this was a new drug, the young were having a rite of passage, the acid trip, that their elders did not understand and found really frightening and scary. Normally, rites of passage in a culture are designed to knit the culture together. So you have the vision quest of the Native Americans or the bar mitzvah of Jews, and it's a, it's, a, it's a trial set up by the adults, and the adolescents do certain things and cross the river and join adult community. Here you had this weird rite of passage that the kids had organized themselves, essentially. So acid these, tests and stuff. Acid tests. And it was landing them in a country of the mind that 
adults didn't understand, and it was frightening to the government. And um, so there was a backlash. Uh, the media turned against it, the government turned against it, and, um, uh, and pretty soon the researchers were out of business. So we're into the second wave. You've been asked this question before. Could another Leary come along and spoil it now? Yeah, it's a good question. I think everybody is so mindful of that example. Um, every researcher I talk to alludes to the example of Leary and they're being very careful not to um, overhype what they've got. And but you've, you know, got, but you've got a whole group of people who believe this is for the betterment of the well, to use the yes. words that you use. In the, in and there the are researchers who will say that off the record. It's very hard to get them to say that on the record, that, that this is not only useful for people who are um, sick, uh, the kinds of people who are being treated for addiction and depression, but that um, it has potential to treat all of us. I wouldn't say they're all off the record. Some of them are on the record, but very careful about saying that. These, and they're right, by the way. These drugs rely on the testimonies of individuals. There's no randomized placebo-controlled trial here. They've tried, but essentially it relies on... It's like pain. It's like studying pain. You've just got to believe somebody when they right. say... That I'm the phenomenology, what else are you going to go on? You're talking about mental experience, yeah. Will there ever be the scientific methodology to allow the regulators to say, yeah, we'll allow psilocybin on the market? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we're not very far from that, believe it or not. So there have been placebo-controlled, randomized trials. It's very hard to do a placebo for a psychedelic. Um, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, and they've tried different things. They give people niacin, which gives you a tingling sensation, or methyl uh, uh, phenidate, uh, Ritalin. Um, but people, you can fool them sometimes, because if you have a naive, you know, someone's never used psychedelics, but basically it's a problem. Nevertheless, they see dramatic differences in the two groups. And uh, on, the, on the cancer anxiety studies, they got a very strong signal, stronger than we have seen in any other psychiatric intervention by the way. And where do you sit on the decriminalization, legalization? So let me, let me just go a little further with this, though, about, about satisfying the FDA. The FDA is not going to... This is the Food and Drug Administration in the United States or the EMA in Europe. Um, they're, they've kind of set out the benchmarks they need to see. And if they can see, um, essentially, if it performs better than placebo or better than uh, a current SSRI in depression, they will approve it. Um, they don't need to, you know, we don't know the brain mechanisms of lots of psychiatric drugs. We still don't know how SSRIs work. Um, so they're not waiting for that kind of information, although it'd be very interesting to get it. And there are people working on it. Now, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to come to questions. And there's a microphone here, a microphone there, and there are two microphones there. We're now spotlighting them conveniently for you. So you can start coming to the microphones now. Uh, when I do, I'm not going to want you to read the Bible to give us a speech. Quick questions so that everybody gets a chance. That'll be great. And I think we'll focus on psychedelics rather than food and plants and the botany of desire. I think that would be a good thing to do. Kind of getting to the end of it, you quote William James a lot, the Harvard psychologist, physician and psychologist, who wrote about the religious experience, almost talking, and he talked about mind cures. Interestingly, is the religious experience just a physiological phenomenon? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, we're, we're learning the, the neural correlates of spiritual experience. I mean, the fact that you can use a chemical to induce or occasion a mystical experience is uh, quite a remarkable finding. What does that tell us? I mean, it may be that there is a physiological basis for religious experience. Um, and some people think that diminishes it, to have a spiritual experience caused by a molecule. But, that, but that's an ex assumption worth examining. It seems to me it's, it's kind of more mystical and, and wonderful that a mushroom that grows in the world that you take into your body can give you a religious experience. Um, that doesn't diminish us at all. We, we tend to assume... There's a, there's, a, there's a whole lot of interesting assumptions about human nature that happen. I mean, that, that it's cheating to use a chemical, for example, to have a spiritual experience. That's a very common belief. And maybe, I mean, I, I'm kind of agnostic on it. You know, it's that idea that if you climb to the top of the mountain, you have earned it in a way that you take a helicopter 
You haven't, yet you have the same view. Um, and is it just our Puritan nature that says, no, you gotta work for it, for it to mean anything? I mean, it may, all, all mental experience is mediated by chemicals, so why the fact that it comes from outside you is cheating rather than it coming from inside? I mean, I, I just think we need to have an open mind about all this, I, I don't know the answer. And your advice is to take a guide and put on the eye mask and put on the headphones and listen well, to them? Well, I, I, I don't advise anybody to do this unless they, they really feel motivated to do it. But if they are going to do it, I think it, you mitigate a lot of the risk by having a guide. You have the potential of having a much deeper ex and thorough experience because of the environment that an experienced guide creates. A guide can be just someone who has a lot more experience than you do, who's not going to be taking the drug with you. Um, but there is, I, I think there are enormous advantages, I found, to, um, to working with a guide. I, I also had a very good experience without one. But at a high dose, um, don't, don't travel solo. Yeah, I, I, I really think that's risky. Let's take some questions. We'll go to microphone three. Uh, hi. Thanks hi. For your, thanks for your time. Um, I'm in the end of a six-year development stage for a science fiction film um, based on human consciousness. And part of the research I've been doing is talking to people like Stuart Hameroff and Sir Roger Penrose about consciousness. And um, also with my research, which is kind of similar to what you've been doing for your research, for your book, I've had experiences um, of seeing something that a lot of other people have had experience of seeing, that being... Um, white discs and, and God consciousness and things like this. Um, now, Sir Roger Penrose talks about the fact that consciousness comes from a realm or an, a world outside of the classical world. And they kind of allude to the fact that psychedelics may be opening up a portal to, to that. Do you um, have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I have some thoughts. You know, one of the things, I mean, I looked at consciousness studies as part of this research, and I was really struck by um, how little we know about it. <laughs> and that, you know, we really don't know how brains produce consciousness, and we're not even certain that's how it's produced. Um, you know, as the Dalai Lama said, uh, the idea that, that, uh, that minds are the, um, are the um, products of brains is an interesting hypothesis. Um, but that's all it is at this point. Um, there are people who think that um, there may be other dimensions of reality. And people on DMT have remarkably, this is a very short acting uh, psychedelic, it's not the same as 5-MeO-DMT. Um, there, there's enormous commonality in the imagery. They see, you know, entities, um, sometimes described as machine elves, um, that live in another dimension. And, and many people who take it believe there is such a dimension and this gives them access to it. I haven't had that experience. Um, I've, you know, I've become more cautious in what I say about consciousness. I think it's more mysterious than I thought going in. And, um, and it's been very interesting to see how consciousness researchers, um, some quite prominent ones, are experimenting with psychedelics. I think psychedelics have the potential in an academic way to teach us about consciousness. Um, one way to understand a complex system is to disturb it. And um, so, for example, a lot of thinking about consciousness now re revolves around this idea of predictive coding, the idea that what you, what you experience is not just raw sensory information coming in, it's projected by you, it's a guess, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's reality is imagined and then error corrected, essentially. Uh, it's a controlled hallucination. And so what happens to that controlled hallucination on, in, in these altered states of consciousness? So altered states of consciousness may end up really illuminating con normal consciousness in important ways. Um, so I, I very much look forward to seeing your film. <laughs> and so. good luck with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> microphone four. Uh, th thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you have come across any studies that uh, look at binaural beats and do, do they have the same effect on the default mode? I'm sorry, network? looking at what? Binaural beats. Oh, yeah. Um, what are binaural beats? Will you define binaural beats? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's using different frequency sound waves into each side of the right. ear to induce a meditative state. 
So I'm just wondering if it can have the same effect on it may, the default I mean, mode network. It may. I mean, you know, the role of, of rhythm in modulating brain waves is, 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 is being experimented with, but not, in a, not with neuroimaging that I know about. I think it'd be really interesting to try that. Um, same with breath work. I mean, you know, a pattern of breathing that, that clearly is having an effect on the default mode network, but, but no one's measured it, partly because people are moving too much. Although the binaural beats you could do, because you could do that very still. Mm -hmm. So I don't know of any such experiment, um, but I think it would be worth doing. It's interesting, all the questions are coming from the gods, isn't it? <laughs> all of it. But not, all, not exclusively. Microphone two. Hello, Michael. Um, a question about chronic depression. Did you get a sense from people that you've spoken to and all the, um, the research papers you've read how long uh, you know, a mushroom trip might alleviate someone's chronic depression for? And are people sort of getting into a rhythm of taking it you know, yeah. annually or quarterly or something like that? Yeah, so the, um, you know, they studied depression in cancer patients and got a very strong signal that endured. Um, but I, I think the depression of a cancer patient is kind of a very specific thing. It has a cause, a recent cause. Um, it, and and uh, people have depression for years and years and years with no apparent cause. So clearly depression is not one thing. There was a study done at Imperial College in London of uh, people with depression. I think treatment resistant treatment depression. Resistant, yeah. And they, they got a very strong response. However, it didn't last very long. Um, they were, uh, people had a month to six months of uh, relief from their depression. This isn't inconsequential, obviously, if you're trying to head like off. ECT. Yeah, in a way, it, it is comparable. And, and ketamine too, although that's even shorter acting. Um, this is another drug used to treat depression. It's not a psychedelic exactly, but gives a psychedelic experience. Um, so the thinking now is that it might be something you would have to renew. Uh, in some ways. And I talked to some people, I talked to one woman in the study at, at um, Imperial College, and she had been, this is an American living in London in her 60s, she had been depressed continuously since 1991. She had her first month of not being depressed. The curtain lifted. Mm. And it was such a powerful experience that even though it came back, she she knew that it could... There was a possibility. There was a po that, yeah, she had this hope that she had not had. Mm. And I know she was going to seek, since the trial wouldn't give her any more psilocybin, she was thinking of, last time I talked to her, she was thinking of going to Amsterdam where you can use psilocybin legally or Mexico. Um, so she was going to seek doing it again. But it appears that the effect fades after a while. Um, is that going to be true with major depression too? These are the hardest cases, treatment-resistant depression. Um, so there's a very big depression trial starting both in the United States and Europe, two of them, with hundreds of, of patients. One is treatment-resistant, one is major depression. And we're going to know a lot more in a couple years about is this effective for depression. Um, and, we, we, and the FDA and the EMA have actually encouraged the researchers to work on depression because they understand how desperate we are for better tools. And, and, and that is, in a way, the background of all this research. And I, I didn't know this, because I'd never written about mental health care, but we have a crisis in mental health care. I mean, we have you know, rising rates of depression, addiction, suicide. And um, the tools that we have are really lousy. I mean, they're, they treat symptoms for the most part. They are addictive very often. They're you know, hard to get off these drugs. And people don't like taking them. And they have to take them every day. And so the prospect of, a, of, a, of, a, of something you only had to take once or every now and then, non-toxic, non-habit forming, um, is, is very exciting to a lot of people in psychiatry. But it's important to say we're not there yet. There, the, the, these larger trials need to happen. Thank you. Microphone three again. Hi. Um, I'm a university student. Um, from the States, actually. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, given the backlash that came from the initial psychedelic movement back in the 60s, how would you recommend people moving forward into this generation avoid that, those pitfalls that kind of brought it down then? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Could we have another backlash? And I think we could. Um, and there, there are a couple things that worry me. Um, one is, um, 
you know, we're studying now, I don't know, 500 people are, uh, d people with serious depression are going to be given psychedelics. Somebody in that cohort is going to commit suicide. And that's going to be a big story. Um, even though suicide is, 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 you know, happens on SSRI antidepressants, either while you're on them or trying to get off them, and that's not a story because it's a risk factor for SSRIs, but it, it has this echo with history and psychedelics of people jumping off of buildings and things like that. So that's one thing that worries me. The other is sexual abuse. Um, you know, you have, uh, in the underground, you only have one therapist, not two. Um, but that there is enormous potential, especially in MDMA work, ecstasy work, um, where you have the volunteer or the patient is, uh, you know, compromised, and, and an unscrupulous therapist could really take, take advantage of that situation. So that worries me too. And the other thing that worries me, frankly, is um, this movement to legalize psilocybin that's um, quite powerful in America now. And I, I do think that these drugs should be decriminalized. I don't think anyone should go to jail for eating a mushroom or growing a mushroom. Um, but I, I think legalization is different, and I don't think, I think having that, I think politicizing it right now would be dangerous, and that's what that movement might do, and I hope they don't. I hope they hold off until the research is much further along, because right now it's not being politicized. It's being treated as medicine, and that's how it should be approached right now, and a big public debate over legalization, I think, is not what we need at the moment. Microphone four. Hi, Michael. Hi. I'm interested to hear whether you had any views on the theory presented primarily by Terence McKenna, McKenna on the yeah. uh, role of psilocybin in the evolution of sort of early humanoid sort of culture. Yeah. So Terence McKenna was, uh, he, he died in the 90s. He was a, a kind of a brilliant theoretician of psychedelics. And there's some wonderful YouTubes where he lays out what he called the stoned ape theory. Um, and he believed that, um, that we had access to psychedelics on the savanna, that it grew in the, in the, in the, you know, cow patties of zebras and zebra patties, I guess, um, and other animals that we were, uh, familiar with, and that the ingestion of this drug, um, changed us, um, was a, a, a selected for certain things, including language. He really believed that it was early psilocybin use that gave us language, that language was a special form of synesthesia, confusing sounds for meanings. And the theory falls apart for me in that I don't understand how, I can understand the role of psychedelics in cultural evolution much more easily than I can in biological evolution. I don't understand how a single event could actually spread uh, Yeah, and that, um, that it would have such a strong, that enough people were using it and that they were advantaged in some ways, that they were reproducing or surviving better. I don't, I don't quite see how that part works. Um, culturally, I do think, uh, I'm much more sympathetic to the theory that psychedelics may have been involved with the birth of religion. Um, that people had, you know, people have been using psychedelics for thousands of years in many different traditions and they do give you a powerful experience of a beyond, of another realm, of an unseen realm. I think they may have had a role in Platonism, you know. I mean, the Greeks were using psychedelics, it appears. Um, so uh, I think that they did have a profound effect on the world as we know it. But on our genes, I'm just not, I haven't seen, I haven't been convinced of that yet. Microphone two. Hey, Michael. Um, just a quick question. Are there um, any women here? <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, I can pretend to be one. Okay. Be I don't want to make any any assumptions of your gender choice. Um, on words like anxiety, depression, OCD, these are all very negative words that we well they have negative connotations to our mental health. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how psychedelics can change the long term um, kind of viewing of these words. For instance, I had a, an experience and it gave me panic attacks for an entire year. And for the first month, I took that as a negative. And afterwards, I decided to learn from it. It was from research. Is it just one experience changes people, you know, in the bigger picture? Yeah, uh, that's, that's interesting. I mean, you know, a lot of the mental health crisis we have, you could argue, represents a sane response to a fucked up uh, civilization. <laughs> and... Um, 
you know, and, and that these are kind of, I don't want to say they're healthy responses, but, but, but logical responses to, a, to a, you know, environmental crisis and tribalism and, 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 you know, very serious problems we face. One of the things that I find really striking about psychedelics, when I think about their social utility, not just their individual utility, is this idea that they do, and this may explain why they've become um, so salient right now, that they do address, at least in the individual, the two biggest crises we face, which, I, in my view, the environmental crisis and the uh, crisis of, around tribalism. And um, both of them are very similar. Both involve the objectifying of the other, right? Whether the other is nature or the other is other people not like you, people of different races, people of different faiths, people of different nationalities. Um, the, the effect on the ego um, addresses both those things. And people on the experience, and this has been actually so Trump measured. Trump should trip. So Trump should trip. This is where people go with this. <laughs> and this is a, this is a meme in, in American culture right now. And here's why I don't think it would work. Um, first of all, his, his ego... His default meme board network must be a sight to see. Oh. <laughs> God. No, I mean, it's his superpower. Objectifying the other is his superpower. He's not going to give up his superpower. Um, so you'd have to dose him without his permission. And as a doctor, you know that's not ethical. Um, There's a bigger story here. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but there is evidence that people who, uh, on a single uh, psilocybin trip, their measures of their nature connectedness, their sense, how much do they feel a part of nature or apart from nature, changes um, consistently across many populations. And also tolerance for authoritarianism goes down. Um, so in some ways, it's exactly the drug we need today. But as I said earlier, how do you treat a society? You know? And that, in a way, was the 50s debate. Um, you know, Timothy Leary just wanted everyone to turn on, tune in, and drop out, or tune in, turn on, and drop out. Um, whereas Al Hubbard, who we talked about earlier, wanted to give it to the people in charge, and so did Aldous Huxley, by the way, and let that consciousness filter down, you know, a kind of more elitist approach or influencer approach. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's a really uh, vexed question, whether a drug can help a whole society. Um, fluoride has helped um, with tooth decay, <laughs> but this is of a very different order. But thank you for your question. And we'll make our last question from a woman. Oh. Yay! Oh. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> well, hi. This is kind of like a two-part question, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, the first part is, am I under the understanding that the holotropic breathwork was a recommendation as a precursor to the psychedelic experience? Yes, in that case. He, he, this, this guide likes to give people a kind of warm-up experience so he can judge how they tolerate psychedelic experience so he knows how much to dose them with the LSD and some other things. And it's a get acquainted kind of thing. Yes. Okay, beautiful. But, it's, but in other contexts, it's used as the experience. And, and there are holotropic breathwork workshops. I'm sure there's some in Sydney. I mean, you can find this. And it's, and it's an interesting experience. But if you have atrial fibrillation, don't do it. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I am a breathwork facilitator. Oh, you are? Okay. So? <laughs> but this is why it brings up the curiosity in my questions. So the, the second part of my question is, is, have you ever considered or have you ever heard of or is it ever talked about in the psychedelic realms using breathwork as a sort of a navigational tool throughout the experience to be able to, you know how you talked about in the psychedelic experience how it's important to let go yes. and it's important to just be with whatever goes. Is there any sort of conversation around using the breath as the ability or the tool to let go into the experience? That's a very interesting question. I mean, I think it's a good way to practice letting go because I think you have to let go to, 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 with the breath work. I mean, it was a very, I mean, you had to be willing to disinhibit in various ways to do it. Um, there is a kind of informal, though. I mean, one of the, the, the pieces of advice you get is breathe deeply. If you're, you know, that they do work with the breath when you're getting anxious. Um, people do have negative experiences, even in the guided trips, some very dark moments. And that will be, usually the guides will talk about it. I, it's not beyond just take several deep breaths. You know, I, I, it's not anything complicated. 
But I think there is a recognition that by changing the breath, you can reset the mind. And, and they do work with that. But my guess is there's more potential. And I hope you develop it. Thank you. Thank it's you. It's on my list. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for your question. I apologize to the cues who are waiting to the questions, but we've gone over time. Um, fantastic questions, really contributed to the discussion. Uh, Michael will be signing books. Um, you've got to buy them first. Um, in the southern... No, if you, have, if you brought books, I'm happy to sign oh, those really? too. Oh, yeah. That's very generous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> buy them for a friend. And in the... I don't know where the south and north is when I'm sitting in the concert hall, but anyway, in the southern foyer, the southern terrace, uh, which is where you come in on the first floor when you come up from the box office. That's where he'll be signing books in a few minutes' time. Please join me in thanking the fabulous Michael Oh, thank Michael you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.